Hey guys, today I'm going to talk about these vet bringbacks. Stay tuned. If you subscribe to my channel, you already know that my favorite videos are vet bringback stories. And today I have a couple of uh, vet bringbacks, uh, some interesting stories, and they, most of it will come from Colonel Eber Hilliard Thomas Jr. Yes, that is a mouthful. And if your name is Eber Thomas, probably in the army, everybody just yelled, Thomas! Uh, I'm used to that. That's what my mother used to say. So throughout the video, if I mistakenly say Thomas, we know that was actually his last name, uh, but I'm sure a lot of people do that. Now he started out uh, as a uh, second lieutenant. Uh, let's go a little bit through his history, but he ended up as a career army officer in logistics. Um, I always think of UPS, our logistics driver, uh, our UPS driver, and uh, the, the person in the shipping room, Kate. Uh, maybe you've seen her in one of my videos, but Kate, we say she's our logistics officer. It sounds a lot better. He truly was an officer and his skills were very valuable to the army. And we're going to find out just how valuable as we go through this story. So I do have a write-up. Actually, this came from Dan, who probably is a professional writer just by the quality of the writing here. And he gathered stories from various family members and put, to, put this together. Whoever ends up uh, buying these materials will get the whole story. But I just want to go out and pull little segments out. It's, I found it very interesting because of the stories that Thomas told uh, after the war was over to his family. Now, some of that, as, as we'll see, some of that becomes whispered down the lane. If any of you have talked to vets um, you know, and, and had them recall stories, it's it's quite common for some of the stories to get confused or, or not make sense. And certainly in this case, we were trying to figure out some of the detail and you'll hear that uh, we're being perfectly honest and so is the writer and so is the family. Uh, but some of the history gets a little bit uh, vague as the years go by. So Thomas at age 13, I uh, usually don't go back this far, but he actually worked in the textile mills. So he was a hard working young man and also had to be pretty smart. Uh, mentioned before, as soon as he went into the Army, uh, you take tests, and he went right to officer training school. Uh, that means he was probably had a pretty high, high IQ. Um, but he went to Clemson University, and he majored in textile engineering. Doesn't sound real interesting, but when you're from a textile mill, textile engineering, and guess what? When he went into the Army, they handpicked him for logistics and the paratroopers. Why? Because he was an expert on the parachutes, the riggings, the quality, the storage, the testing, all of that, that was his specialty. And so he immediately became very valuable to the army. Now he was drafted, so he's working in the textile factory as a foreman um, in 1941 when Pearl Harbor happens, obviously December 7th. Um, after that, January of 42, so right away, he went into the army. And they, because of his background in textile and logistics, they sent him to the paratroopers. Uh, he went to officer training school uh, in Fort Benning, but after that he went to Tekoa, uh, where I believe all the 101st Airborne and most of the and 82nd, I think most of the Airborne divisions were trained in Camp Tekoa. You see a lot of that in Band of Brothers. It's actually Ross, I think, uh, who's uh, being trained there along with uh, Captain Winters. Uh, not Captain yet, but uh, Captain Winters. Uh, and so that's where uh, he received his training. So Thomas was assigned to the 101st Para Parachute Infantry Regiment, which later on was attached to the 101st Airborne. Uh, but again, this is during training, and he did qualify as a paratrooper in uh, jump training school. So he went through all the same training as everybody else. But again, uh, he starts off as a second lieutenant officer in the logistics department of the 101st Parachute Infantry Regiment. Again, just like his name, it's a mouthful. Uh, this is the, the logo. Uh, I, I happen to be familiar with it, uh, but the Geronimo and the parachute uh, logo, again, that was attached to the 101st Airborne because after training, and by the way, there's like two years, at least two years of training, more than two years, uh, because he doesn't go to England until January of 1944. That was when most of the uh, 101st went to England and they continued their training there, of course, waiting for D-Day. Now on D-Day, uh, his unit did parachute behind enemy lines, but he, he parachuted in 
D-Day plus three. Uh, so that's important to keep in mind. And what he said, and later the quotes will say, the commanding officers did not want to risk his life in the earlier drops uh, because he was so valuable. So the logistical people, and we, uh, a previous video, I talked about a surgeon who went in D-Day plus four. Uh, so medical staff and the, some of the logistical people uh, came about three or four days later, but he did parachute in. There is a story in here which indicates he was injured, never received a Purple Heart, uh, but he sprained his, his leg or knee, uh, later had uh, problems with his back uh, from other jumps. And so he was injured several times as a paratrooper, but never received a Purple Heart. The family goes on to report that um, after the initial invasion, and uh, so this is now July, middle of July, 1944, uh, he and his unit all go back to England for more training because their next mission was Operation Market Garden. Uh, those of you who know that they, they were assigned to capture bridges. Uh, they were going to try to fast track uh, the invasion of Germany itself. The paratroopers were assigned to capture the bridges and he was a part of that operation as well. Uh, you probably know that the British were assigned to uh, go to the furthest bridge out, and that's where the movie, A Bridge Too Far, uh, it was one bridge too far. Uh, all the units, all the paratrooper units, uh, achieved their objectives, except for the British, uh, who generally uh, were slaughtered in, in that battle. Um, some were captured, but it's a, it's a fascinating story. If you haven't seen the movie, check out A Bridge Too Far. It was there, again, in Holland during that operation that his family, uh, their recollection was that he picked up this German Luger. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm not sure uh, about that. And it could be that, again, over time, uh, memories fade. The other thing is a lot of people, it's a nine, uh, nine millimeter Luger. This shoots nine millimeter Luger. And I have had uh, family members tell me, um, oh, my, my grandfather had a Luger and they bring me a P-38. So there is some confusion about what he captured, but I just wanted to let you know. Uh, there is a story that he captured a German Luger uh, during the Operation Market Garden. I'm going to show you this in just a bit. Now, there's a, a couple of vignettes. One of them I want to read word for word because it's so compelling, but um, it talks about he was then involved in the Battle of Bastogne. The 501st uh, Parachute Division was in Bastogne along with the rest of the 100 and, well, many of the 101st Airborne. Uh, so he talks about that. He also talks about the Battle of the Bulge. And finally, they talk about him crossing into Germany. And I believe most of them were in southern Germany, I think they ended the war in, in about the Munich area. You know, if you watch the news, whenever they say to our viewing audit audience, uh, we need to caution you that this is going to get graphic. You might want to leave the room. Women and children go to the basement. Um, as soon as I, uh, whenever they say that, if I'm half paying attention, they say a warning, the, the images you're about to see are graphic. I usually perk up and watch. Um, but I do seriously want to warn you that some of this is pretty graphic. Uh, he talks about the, fa the, the fact, or the family uh, talks about the fact that uh, whenever he talked about the war, he would um, often start to tell a story and then just stop and change the subject. Uh, so uh, dad, as they called him, uh, didn't like to talk about the war. And here's a reason why. Whenever you talk to a vet and they say, I, you know, dad never talked about it, grandpa never talked about it, Here's one of the reasons why, uh, because at some point um, the family tells this story. Dad led the detail to collect bodies. His team would go out and put bodies into bob body bags, load them onto trucks, and take them to collection areas where the grave registration units took over. It was gruesome, he said, but when they gave you a job, you just had to do it. The grave registration officer and his crew were busy recovering bodies of those killed by artillery fire. It was not a pleasant job. Even less agreeable was the retrieving of the British paratroopers who died during the earlier days of Arnheim. One truckload uh, was a mass of green flesh and dry blood with maggots oozing out between the cracks and the bottom of the truck. The truck was left overnight in a field and the next morning to the horror of the villagers, scores of small and very cur curious little Dutch children had surrounded the vehicle. Dad was stoic about anything uh, having to do with the war. If he told a story, he only told a little bit, and that's all. I think because he was a career army officer, it was very different experience for the men who fought and then left. But for the career guys, they spoke amongst themselves all the time. And they didn't have to go into any detail because the others already knew. 
Dad wanted to be on the front lines, but his CO always said no. He was too important making sure parachutes were maintained and working when supplies were critically needed. I think he understood why he was kept safe, but he felt he should have been in the front. However, he never sounded grateful or annoyed or ever made any excuses. There's other stories that um, I'm not going to go into, uh, but just, uh, just to say there's just some different experiences that he told family members from time to time, but it seems like there's just little pieces here and little pieces there. There was one other uh, quote that I wanted to read you because it was something I hadn't heard before. Okay, in previous videos I talked about at the end of the war, waiting to go home. If you were injured, uh, you, got, you were moved to the front of the line. If you, uh, uh, depending on your rank, you might be moved up, uh, but also how long you'd been in theater. Uh, certainly, you know, certainly if you had a, a silver star or a bronze star, any kind of award, they kind of, you earn points. And uh, he talks about the fact that he only had 81 points, and that was not enough to get, get home anytime soon. He mentions that he and Mary, he ma married Mary, by the way, in 1940, uh, before the war started, and they had no children. And he said um, uh, that he had 81 points and they had no kids. He had wished that they had had children together because he said, you got 12 points for every ki kid you had waiting at home. I never knew that. You did get points for having children and they were worth 12. Okay, one more segment, it's called Relics of War. And this is just, he covers the things that he sent home. Dad sent home chocolates and boiled sweets. I don't know what boiled sweets are. I've had boiled peanuts. If you've been down south, boiled peanuts. Uh, some of you, uh, somebody out there, maybe from uh, Europe, will tell me what boiled sweets are. Uh, he mentions a armband flag, a compass, a cigarette lighter, French, Bel Belgian, and Dutch currencies, a pocket knife, a high caliber brass casing. Uh, for those of you who don't know, they would send home ornamental brass casings. Many times it would be 50 caliber machine gun or uh, sometimes like uh, 20 millimeter cannon uh, casings. I, I can't imagine it being worth the postage, but then again, I believe all the postage was free for the uh, GI sending things home. A cloth map, it's actually a silk map uh, that the paratroopers used uh, showing the zones of France, and this would be escape routes. I happen to have one. Uh, the family did not have it, but this is the uh, silk map. Uh, I bought a paratrooper's uniform at one point. Uh, this is um, a, the, one of the silk maps that paratroopers would, um, would carry. And again, I got this from a, a uniform. It was in the pocket. This shows the English Channel, escape routes down through uh, Spain, and I guess that was the best way to go. You didn't want to go further into occupied territory, so if you did get away, you would want to head south, and this is uh, uh, one of the silk maps that he would have sent home. Now we get into the even better stuff because he says um, three pistols. I keep saying he, but this is really Dan writing the story as told by family members, both male and female. Uh, one Luger, and that was this one. I'll give you a close-up of that. Uh, one P-38, and that is this one. And then one special order FN model 1905. This is pretty cool. Uh, this is the special order. Um, it also has Captain uh, E-H, remember Eber Hilliard Thomas, E-H Thomas. And it's G-4 section. G-4 section is logistics. Um, so let's take a look at this one first, since you're already up close and personal. Let's take a look. Uh, there's a closer look at the writing. That's probably his, his signature. This is the, the holster, which has not been modified, but isn't that interesting? That does look like an original holster, and this is uh, made by FN. I believe it is a model 1905, but it has the extended barrel. Now, um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. It looks like this one was made in 29 and it does have factory stamps on it. And the barrel also has factory stamps on it. Although it, it, I, I believe the barrel was swapped out, that's what I'm getting to. You do see the bore holes where it was stored and the bores got, because this was a uh, horn. I guess it could have been bullhorn, but a lot of people say rhino horn. Uh, later they used Bakelite, but the really early ones were made with horn and the boars would get in there and eat it. So that's, this is a really early gun, maybe modified at the factory with the longer barrel because, and what he writes um, in the uh, memoirs, 
Uh, this is 25 caliber, by the way. What he writes in the memoirs was that after the war, for concealed weapons, you had to have a certain barrel length. And what we're going to find out next is that Thomas, after the war, he went home for a brief period of time and then went back because, again, he's a career army officer. He went back and worked in, um, for the U.S. Army in Austria in the logistics department. And so he picked this up probably as a personal carry piece. It wouldn't have been like he had a military issued weapon, but it seems like he liked this. Uh, this looks like these are all proper proofs. Uh, so this barrel at some point was put on this gun, I guess, to satisfy the standards, the carry piece standards of the time. And then you can see how the holster itself uh, was made specifically. It's like custom made. So it's a very cool gun. And let me show you the capture papers that came with it. The P38, I'll show you that next. Uh, that's actually the, the uh, probably the most valuable gun in the lot, the German Luger serial number. This gun is missing, and in, in the uh, write-up, it says he brought home three pistols. Clearly, 1950, he's in Austria. So the war is over. He's stationed in um, Austria. He's, uh, he, that is, that's an uh, American post and he's the logistics officer there. There is a, a weapon that is now missing, so maybe he gave it away or sold it somewhere along the line. And then this is the uh, Browning. Uh, he says six uh, millimeter, but actually it's 25 caliber. You can see their confusion. It's actually 6.35, which is actually written in there, but they did six millimeter, three five. <laughs> Again, I think this was added after the war. He's in Austria, he picks up a carry piece, they had restrictions on barrel length, and that's how he came. That's me filling in the blanks. That's where the memories are somewhat faded because, um, you know, they, they would think that he took this from a, a German officer. I don't think so because of the barrel. Well, he could have, but then maybe he had the barrel switched out. Maybe he picked it up from a German officer and then later swapped the barrel himself. Uh, and the reason that's possible is we're going to look at a gun that was altered. Okay, I said the P-38 would be next, but I lied. I'm doing the Luger now because that's transition into this gun has definitely been refinished. Now, it's, uh, this gun uh, he, he was captured, and they talked about this being, uh, you can see that's the correct Waffenproofs for a Black Widow, which is BYF-41. Again, Mauser Factory, 1941. Black plastic grips, and by the way, these plastic grips are post-war. Um, I did examine them pretty carefully. The, the black grips, I believe, are post-war. Um, pretty sure. I, I, you know, I, they seem post-war, although they um, taken apart. Um, they do look really good. This is a wartime magazine. So, uh, but what, what is the dead giveaway? Uh, the bluing looks really nice, but there should be no straw parts on a military-made gun. Notice the straw parts. Also notice the rust here. So this was redone. It's rusted. Redone, rusted. I also see a little bit of rust right here. Um, all that is to say, being redone, it had to be redone a long time ago. Um, the Black Widows did not have straw. Here's a picture of one, what it should look like when it originally came from the factory. If he captured this, um, you know, sometime during the war, and we talk about Operation Market Garden, he could have kept it with him. Being an officer, he would have a little more ability to store things or keep things uh, that the common soldier, you know, um, schlepping around with a, with a duffel bag uh, may not want to carry all these guns, but he, he definitely could have carried this with him. But sometime uh, look at the fact that he's in Austria until 1950. After the war, we know that there was a cottage industry of Germans and Austrian citizens who were trying to satisfy the souvenir needs of the American army. So for example, a lot of daggers were put together. Um, the factories that were left with parts, um, daggers I know were put together post-war and sold to the GIs. I, I know a guy, uh, talked to him personally, and he said uh, he would buy up uh, from the locals, he would buy up a lot of daggers after the war that they went back and put together. They were trying to make money. They had no, almost no economy, and so they were trying to make money any way they could. It would be my belief that he captured this uh, German uh, weapon, or he bought it like this, but more likely he captured it. And sometime while he was in Austria, somebody said, hey, I can make that look better. And they did. It's a beautiful gun. Uh, the average uh, person, average person watching this video would say, I don't see anything wrong with it. It's very well done. 
Uh, the only reason I know is I study these things and I know that this was not, this what I call straw parts, it's actually straw colored parts. They don't make them with straw, they're metal, uh, but they use a heating process to turn them into a straw color. That was not done on the BYF-41. So this gun was redone. Now, going back to the P-38, and I like to say this is the money shot, <laughs> um, and people like to comment on that, but this is the money shot. This is where the money is. Uh, this, uh, for those of you who do collect P-38s, you're getting real excited. This is the uh, 8711, and there it is, 8711, in the E block. So this was made in 1945. Remember the other one was BYF-41? Uh, uh, this is, in 1945, the factory code went, there's more to the story, but to simplify it, in 1945, uh, they went from BYF to uh, SVW. So SVW is the Mauser factory, 1945. You'll see the, the military proof mark here. And then you'll see, very hard to see, but there are three. There's a test firing proof and then two military proofs on either side. So there's an eagle with a swastika underneath it and then two uh, military proofs. But uh, what makes this exciting is this was the, one of the last ones made. Uh, it's a late serial number in the E block. Um, the E block was uh, right before they took over the factory. After that, in the F block, they are almost always mismatched and put together by the French. So the French took over the Mauser factory. By the F block, uh, they, were, they were being put together by the French, the Germany. The German army was kaput, as they say. Uh, German army was gone, uh, left the factory, and so now the French took over and were putting them together. Again, many of them are mismatched, or they'll be matching and they'll have a French star. Here's a picture of one, uh, has the French star. Uh, so this is one of the last ones made uh, during the reign of the Third Reich. Uh, look how beautiful those grips are. Uh, that's a uh, soft plastic, um, uh, typical Mauser soft plastic grip. And then the magazine uh, looks all correct. It does, looks like it has a very faint Waffen proof. But again, this is nine millimeter Luger. Also, I wanted to point out is dual tone. You can see phosphate finish here, a little different than the blue. That's a dull blue, that's a phosphate. You can really see it with the barrel, that's a blued finish, and this is a phosphate finish. So uh, the Germans were experimenting toward the end with the phosphate finish because it was uh, cheaper. Um, they weren't sure it was as durable. In my opinion, the phosphate finish is cheaper, but it's not as durable, the blued finish. So uh, blue finish, I think, held up a little bit better but this is a great example, a beautiful example, of a vet bring back of a dual tone uh, Mauser made 1945 P38. One of the last ones made. Okay, just to finish up the story of Colonel Eber Hilliard Thomas Jr. Um, he did finish up his uh, career with the Army. Uh, he stayed in Europe for, uh, it looks like throughout the Korean War, he was in the European theater helping uh, reestablish well under the Marshall Plan they were rebuilding and they actually retrained the army and, and uh, those kind of things in Austria and Germany and with his logistical background he was ideal for that uh, he also served in Hawaii Japan and Vietnam yes he was stationed in Vietnam for a period of time he didn't see any combat in Vietnam but he did serve in, in Vietnam as an officer logistical officer and then also spend a good bit of time in Japan after World War uh, II uh, the 101st was de deactivated, so he transferred to the 82nd Airborne. Uh, but uh, during the World War II, uh, he was authorized the European Theater Ribbon, uh, also four campaign stars and the Arrowhead. He was also awarded the Bronze Star with Oak Leaf Cluster and two Presidential Citation Ribbons. Uh, this was uh, during World War II, but then also in Vietnam, he uh, received several, uh, up to Vietnam, he received several promotions and other awards. Unfortunately, his last days were in 1995. He was diagnosed with cancer. Actually, it was December of 1995, and by June of 1996, he passed away from lung cancer. I want to read a summary that uh, I mentioned, uh, Dan, who wrote a lot of this up from the recollections of the family. Uh, he wrote a summary that I wanted to read to you. 
In sorting out the myriad of documents, papers, and photographs he retained from his military service, I learned about his successes and his disappointments, which he came to accept. He was a diplomatic, tactful, and honorable man. He died on July 13, 1996. His courage cannot be measured by deeds such as Audie Murphy or John McCain's war experience. Yet his deeds clearly reflect a competent and dutiful man of courage. Thank you for your service. Okay, don't want to be anticlimactic, but um, I also wanted to show you one more thing really quickly because I get a chuckle out of this map case. Uh, I did a couple videos where we show um, period photographs. And every photograph has at least one officer. We joke about the fact, it's not literally true, but we show all these photographs with officers with map cases. And I said, if every photo has somebody with a map case, why is it I never see any map cases? And so guess what came in? We got this map case. Uh, come take a look. Okay, once again, family of the vet uh, sent this to us. It's a map case. And again, I opened it up, I got a chuckle. Uh, inside the map case, by the way, uh, came with it this Hitler Youth Knife. You'll notice that this is broken. I just showed you one where they covered this with a steel insert. Um, and the other one, this was broken off. And here, here you can see that the uh, leather piece that goes around your belt is broken off. Uh, this is also an early one that says Blood and Honor or Blut und Er. Um, somebody complimented me on my German pronunciation. This one's made um, by Tiger in Soligen. And so this came home and there's a capture paper here which indicates a llama pistol. Just like the other capture paper, there's a pistol missing. This one, the pistol is missing and it's a llama, 32 caliber. We see a German map case and the Hitler Youth Knife. This came, all came from the family. Now the map case, um, I have a couple theories about this map case. First of all, it's dated 1935, which of course is before the war, really early. And that says, I believe, flight school. Um, and this is probably the name, it's written twice, Paul J, and then I can't make it out, it might be in Hein or Hearn, and then it's written again, Paul J something. Um, so that's there, but also, I think he used this as a sketch pad, and here's why. Uh, this is probably a maker mark. I can make out flight school. That looks like an American Indian. Do you see the headdress? You can see the face. There's the nose, the mouth. You can see the face right here. And then you see the headdress. There's also writing underneath here. It's a stamp. I can't really make that out, but this headdress goes all the way down. Just that by the way he's doing this, I think it was like a sketch pad, and so probably when he had free time, he took out his number two pencil. Now you don't want a number three pencil. You have to have a number two pencil. Uh, he would take out his number two pencil and sketch. But um, again, uh, there's also this ruler, which I believe was probably bought off of eBay uh, because this looks brand new and still gets splinters from it. Uh, and it says Luftwaffe, but I do believe that he was in flights, flight school, not fight school, but flight school. And this, uh, in 1935, by the way, that would be the NSFK. Um, and not sure of the value, but we'll, we'll figure that out and keep these together because of the capture papers. Uh, we want to keep the map case and the Hitler Youth Knife together. Uh, speaking of keeping things together, for the items uh, from Thomas, uh, we have uh, the three pistols by serial number, and this is signed by the family and then uh, notarized. Uh, what I wanted to make, I uh, don't want to have you guys looking them up. Uh, so uh, one of the things I wanted to mention is that in this case, we have three copies of the same letter and three copies of the capture paper. Usually I try to keep all of this together um, but in this case, because one of them was redone, one of them was probably a carry piece from 1950, um, and one of them is a rock solid World War II uh, bring back, it's possible that somebody may not want all three. So I almost never break them up, but in this case, my preference is to keep them together, and I will give first priority to somebody who wants all three of these. But if um, after a couple of weeks that doesn't work, I uh, would break these up, and as I said, we have three different documents, one for each of the pistols. 
Hey, that was a lot of information, but I learned something in going through all of that. And I hope uh, each and every one of you did as well. Thanks for all your positive feedback, especially about the vet bringbacks. For those of you who are vets, uh, certainly thank you for your service. But also, I love your comments, uh, either family of vets or vets when they say, you know, my dad went through this or my grandfather went through that or my grandmother. We'd love to hear your comments. So make sure you like and subscribe and feel free to respectfully comment.